All right. All right. Hey, everybody. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Michael Allen. I work here at Coral with our development team, work with our major gifts community. And so thank you for joining us today. It's so wonderful to have you uh, for our 2023 State of the Reef Address uh, featuring our executive director, Heather Stark, and several members of the Coral team. We're so glad that you could take a little bit of time out of your day to be with us and hear from us today. So before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, we're going to keep a live chat open for you. So you'll see a button for that down at the bottom of your screen. However, if you have questions, be sure and use the Q&A uh, button at the, also at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so we'll be taking some time for questions and answers towards the end of the presentation. And uh, we'll be monitoring that Q&A field uh, throughout the presentation. So if you have questions, just go ahead and post them and we will do our best to get to those uh, at the end. And of course, we may not have time to get to everyone's questions, but uh, so bear with us, but we'll certainly certainly do our best. Um, okay, and then also remember that you can post uh, any comments that you'd like in the live chat. So post to your heart, heart's content. All right, well, we're just gonna jump right into it. I'm gonna turn it over to Heather Stark, our executive director. Uh, we're super excited to have Heather on board. She's been with Coral since July. Uh, she brings a wealth of experience from the nonprofit sector, previously working at the o National Audubon Society and brings a terrific uh, passion for conservation. And uh, we're just so excited to have her. So I'm gonna, I think, let's just dive right in. Heather, you wanna take it away? Sure, thanks, Michael. Um, really appreciate everyone um, committing to time today. Um, we recognize how valuable you are to the organization, and we really can't do any of what we're going to talk about today without you. Um, so, so glad you're able to hop on today and um, allow us to thank you in person. So, thanks so much. I, I wanted to start by telling a little bit of my personal story and why the ocean and ocean conservation and coral reefs are so important to me personally. Um, and there's so many stories I could choose from, but I thought I would just start uh, with two. One is, you know, when I was in high school, all, all the way back then, <laughs> um, I visited Four Far Field Station in the Bahamas. And this was a really important moment in my life and sort of shaped my career. Any of you that have been to Andros Island where Four Far is, um, you probably know about the huge barracudas that are there and all the different kinds of sharks. And just being there and being in the water and experiencing that early, early on really helped shape uh, my passion and, and my career. Um, I was really fortunate that later on, many years later, um, when I was with National Audubon Society, I was actually able to help create 113 acre national park in the Jolter Keys right there where Forfar uh, Field Station is and help them move forward on their protection of their marine environment. So, so lucky to um, be working in this field and I'm really um, passionate about it. Um, as far as diving, I know a lot of you on the call are divers. Um, I got my diving certification when I was in college and I remember just after college, this time in my life um, where I visited Cozumel uh, two or three times a year. And it really shaped how I see the underworld environment. It really made me understand how connected we all are and, um, and also just all the inner workings of a coral reef. Uh, I remember the dives there. One of my favorite fish to see was a yellow-headed jawfish. And for those of you that know that fish, they just kind of pop up and down um, on the bottom, on the sand, and they burrow and they you know, hold rocks in their mouth and they sort of create this whole little system for themselves. And I literally spent hours <laughs> underwater watching them. And it's also the first place that I witnessed parrotfish sleeping. And many of you know this and I've seen it, but they create this mucus sort of sleeping bag around themselves while they sleep and they just sort of sway with the, with the water. Um, and those, those kinds of things are just really um, fascinating to me. And I'm excited that part of our program also includes Cozumel and you'll hear more about that later. Um, I also today wanted to start by really talking about the state of the reefs. 
that's the title here. That's why you came. And um, so we're, I'm going to go through some quick sort of high level things about how our reefs are doing. Uh, they're in, they're still in sort of rapid decline. And so we're going to get to a lot of hope and why we have hope, but I do want to talk about for a minute, the situation. So because they're in decline, it means $11 trillion annually in food, tourism, and coastal protection are in jeopardy. Our science is telling us that 75% of reefs are currently threatened. And this is anticipated to climb to 90% by 2030. We're also seeing that stony coral tissue loss disease, especially now in the uh, Western Caribbean, is spreading at 155 meters per day. And then also in that same region, Western Caribbean, 31% of the reefs we monitor are in critical status, and that has doubled in the last two years. Some of the good news is that 56% of the reefs in the region are in marine protected areas or MPAs you hear us talk a lot about. Um, these are areas that are permanently protected from human, human disturbance. But out of those reefs that are in those protected areas, only 2.6% of them prohibit fishing and many of them are not effectively managed. So, you know, you can, you can, structure an area and call it a marine protected area, but if you don't have the ability to patrol or enforce any of that, um, it, that's, that's where it's not being effectively managed. So we have our eye on those things. So that was a lot, <laughs> but I do wanna give you a couple reasons that we here at Coral have hope, that I personally have hope, and it starts with all of you, my family, uh, the way my daughter, uh, who's a senior in, in high school, sort of sees the world and thinks about these issues, all of those are reasons for hope. And we have some great things that are happening globally. So 341 commitments to worth nearly 20 billion were made at the o our ocean conference this month in Panama. What is more hopeful than that? They're including funding for expanding and improving marine protected areas and, and biodiversity corridors. Another really exciting thing is 193 countries, the UN agreed to the first of its kind high seas treaty to protect the world's ocean. And 30% of the oceans will be protected under a global framework reached at the Convention of Biological Diversity. All of the signatory nations agreed to historic international collaboration on ambitious goals, including conserving 30% of our lands and oceans by 2030. This was included in the agreement that the nations reached at the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, the 15th Conference of Parties. That's a huge name, but basically many of you know it by COP15. So this global framework is to safeguard nature, halt and re reverse biodiversity loss, and it puts nature really on a path to recovery by 2050. So this conference that was held in Montreal, Quebec in December, Coral participated. We hosted a booth um, and we were very active in a side event called United for a Decade of Conservation Action. So the newly ratified UN High Seas Treaty, it's really a, com a culmination of a decade of work, and it's a huge win for the uh, world's marine biodiversity. It provides a le legal framework. It, it makes possible restoration and regulation of two thirds of our ocean. So even though those stats were hard to hear at the beginning, there's a lot of movement towards really great things, and we're excited to be part of it. So our vision and approach here at Coral, I just want to talk about that for a minute so that you can um, hear from staff in the field in a little bit. So our team here at Coral is, they're, to the individual, super inspiring. And we are excited to create focus and discipline to ensure that coral reefs can adapt to climate change. So we're using four key strategies to achieve our mission. We're making sure that communities that depend on coral reefs are resilient themselves. We're developing healthy fisheries for reefs. We're ensuring that there is clean water to keep reefs healthy and strong. And we're making sure that coral reefs can adapt to climate change. Because if we can implement these strategies, 
in really strategic locations, then we believe that we can achieve our vision that coral reefs are healthy and can adapt to climate change because we've reduced local threats while leveraging our science and technology to scale to global solutions. So in a few minutes, we're gonna be taking you to our field sites and show you some of this work in progress. And you'll definitely wanna stay on for that part. So I'm gonna go just a little bit more in depth in, in a few of these and talk about uh, some of the, the ways that we do the work and what, what's planned looking forward. So creating resilient coastal communities, what we do is we build the resilience of the communities that depend on coral reefs for food and income, and we develop their capacity to protect the reefs for generations to come. We do this by relationship building, information management, fundraising, and technical support so that we can facilitate trust and enable informed decision-making and implementation of resource management. One example of this, and there are many, um, it, it just, it requires us to think outside of the box sometimes. So we were able to fund a chicken cooperative in Tela in Honduras, and this created a year round food source that creates job opportunities for women, but also allows for a closed season on fishing without sacrificing putting table, food on the table or income. Looking forward, an important piece of building resilient communities is ensuring sustainable, reef-friendly tourism. In Cozumel, Mexico, reef-related tourism is estimated to generate more than 3.4 billion, with a B, in revenue in a typical year. And we want all these communities to have all the resources they need to protect and preserve reefs while also earning incomes that are needed. So we ensure that these resources are in place by creating destination management organizations. So the role of those DMOs is to responsibly manage and market tourism. And so DMOs help to establish a competitive edge for, de for the destination, ensure long-term sustainability, and strengthen institutional governance. So building on coral success with launching and supporting destination management organizations in Cozumel and Roatan, Honduras, we will actually be expanding this work to Belize, one of our newest field sites. So in Hawaii, uh, we recently entered into partnerships to build the capacity of three local nonprofits across the Hawaiian islands to scale watershed and fish pond restoration and create management plans for protected areas on reefs that are important for the movement of coral larvae. Through these partnerships, we can ensure that our work is lasting and community driven. So sustainable fisheries is another one of our strategies I mentioned, and we protect coral reef ecosystems from the effects of unsustainable fishing. We ensure that there are stable or increasing number of reef building corals, herbivorous fish, and commercial fish populations by preserving fish habitats while supporting the underlying economic and social drivers that lead to better reef health. So as we look forward in the Western Caribbean, we are going to build a training program for fishers to train in sustainable tourism and help them understand which species of fish are sustainable to, for their fishing practices. This year, we're also conducting a traceability study to ensure that in the long term, the supply of fish is transparent and set the foundation for a national traceability framework. This includes genetic testing to ensure that the products are locally sourced and prop properly labeled. We also have plans to expand our marine patrolling program. Many of you have supported that over time. And we're going to deploy technology for marine protected area patrol boats so that they can also continue or start to uh, collect illegal fishing data. In Hawaii, starting this fall, we will be working to restore fish ponds on the island of Molokai. While the main focus of the project is sediment reduction and in species, in, in, really, 
invasive species, I've said that many times, uh, removal, a co-benefit of the project is overall improvement to fisheries and reef health in, in South Molokai. So our next strategy, clean water for reefs, we protect reef ecosystems from land-based sources of pollution. And we monitor water quality to inform multi-level decision-making. We have some great examples of where we are carrying out this work in both Hawaii and Honduras. In a moment, you're gonna hear from those locations and a few of our really dedicated team members. So in the Western Caribbean, Coral and our partners have stepped in to develop and connect nearly 300 homes and businesses to a wastewater treatment facility that's new. So today, the water in Rotan is now passing clean water standards and giving coral reefs there a chance to survive and thrive. And we are keeping nearly 30 million gallons of sewage out of the ocean every year. And building on these past successes, we are going to apply our sustainable wastewater management solution to two more communities, West Bay and Coxon Hole, to protect key reefs in Honduras and provide additional successful case studies for the Western Caribbean and beyond. Our water quality monitoring is a coordinated collaborative effort to measure water quality to empower stakeholders to make informed and targeted conservation decisions. And we will be adding at least four new sites to show the need in certain areas for wastewater treatment. And we wanna share this information. It's important to share and scale lessons learned to priorities, prioritize water quality as a regional effort within the Western Caribbean. So we're really excited about that initiative this year. In Hawaii, we are working on both Maui and the Big Island, and we have a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Through the State Water Cesspool Conversion Working Group, that's another long name, we're using our expertise on our staff on wastewater and sanitation to push for funding and a quicker timeline to convert homes off of these cesspools. And we're seeing a lot of hope because there's currently 20 bills before the legislature to help with this and to as well as infrastructure funding available through the Biden administration now. So looking forward, we plan to expand the water quality monitoring program with an additional six annual sampling events and develop a community science water quality monitoring program for the first time on Molokai in partnership with our local partner there um, on Molokai. We also plan to expand our Maui watershed restoration program to include the restoration of stream banks, which cause large amounts of sediment and stormwater runoff onto coral reefs. So you'll hear more about that from our Maui team. And then our last, but certainly not least, strategy on climate adaptation. We're using scientific research and monitoring to guide us in how to effectively reduce local threats to reefs and how to create the conditions that support evolutionary adaptation to climate change. When we identify critical knowledge gaps and we spearhead in innovation research to fill them. So we're sharing information, we're building alliances across the globe we're providing tools and guidance and lessons learned. And this is another reason to be hopeful. It's being driven by our science within our own global conservation program. And this team is really cutting edge with their science. Um, they're working with partners and aligning them with our strategies on ocean temperature and climate change models. This team is building tools that will enable conservationists as well as marine spatial planners to identify and prioritize the coral reefs that have the highest possibility of adapting to climate change. So I'm not gonna talk any more about that. I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Helen Fox who, who will tell us a little bit more about what the future holds. All right, thank you so much, Heather. Uh, very grateful for the opportunity to share with you all. And so I'm gonna dive more into that fourth bucket of work that Heather mentioned, uh, advancing the science around adaptation and evolution to allow corals to adapt to the environmental changes that are coming their way with climate change. 
Uh, but first, I want to show you the faces of our conservation science team. Uh, we're small but mighty. Ben Chero is our program coordinator and helps out on multiple fronts. Uh, and Andrea Rivera Sosa leads our bleaching monitoring program in collaboration with the Allen Coral Atlas, which is what you see, the picture you see there, uh, and which I'll describe in more detail. So in case you're unfamiliar with the Allen Coral Atlas, it's a new resource that maps the world's coral reefs and monitors their threats to provide actionable data and a shared understanding of coral ecosystems. So 2022 has seen a number of milestones for the Atlas. Uh, this is the landing page and it shows the big three. Uh, it includes updating many of the global habitat maps, which is what you see in the lower left. Uh, improving the Atlas's coral bleaching algorithm, which is what's in the bottom middle there. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, and also just this year or last year was launched uh, mapped quarterly turbidity in the lower right. And so that's a, a indication of water quality and will be useful for a number of different applications. And so coral is part of the Atlas partnership, and we're actually leading on coordinating the field component of coral bleaching monitoring. And this is helping uh, improve the detection of bleaching from space. And Arizona State University is the lead of the Atlas overall and the sort of that bleaching detection algorithm. The picture here shows Andrea diving on her field trip to Columbia. She and Brianna Bambic, who, is, who you see up on the top, were part of the first international team to join this expedition to the Seaflower Banks with the Colombian Ocean Commission. Uh, they conducted field work and training on the Atlas and on monitor, monitoring bleaching underwater, which will, uh, and then this data is going to be shared with the overall Atlas lead to improve that bleaching algorithm. Right. And we also made progress uh, in our other major stream of work, which is developing estimates for genetic diversity using the Allen Coral Atlas. Uh, what you're seeing here, uh, the map is of the island of Roatan with the sites where we have temperature loggers shown uh, with the black dots. And we also uh, last year collected tiny coral samples for analysis of genetic diversity with the goal of seeing that and the temperature diversity from the loggers are correlated to uh, a course metric of habitat complexity, which we calculated using the Atlas. And that's the color ramp, the blue to yellow color ramp that you see there. So the goal is to uh, develop a layer that serves as a proxy for genetic variability and I'm hopeful because if we can create this tool in the next two to three years, then we'll be able to influence marine spatial planning processes for the better. Uh, as Heather mentioned in her introduction, uh, in December of last year, an agreement was reached in Montreal where 190 plus nations uh, aimed to halt a dangerous decline in biodiversity, agreed to preserve 30% of the planet's land and seas by 2030. So this is a big policy window of opportunity to help us reach our goal of well-connected and well-protected large networks of reefs. So this gives us a sense of urgency to our work and also facilitates conversations with partners around the world. Uh, so over the past year, we had the opportunity to present at the International Coral Reef Symposium, uh, we had actually a booth at the uh, a coral event at the COP15, and the picture there is of me just last month at the International Marine Protected Area Congress. So that's just a brief snapshot of our work uh, on the science team to influence and leverage partners, field work, and technology to drive conservation solutions that will rescue coral reefs from the effects of climate change. So with that, I'll thank you again and turn it back over to Heather. Thanks, Helen. I really appreciate you and all of your team. Um, so now we wanna take a moment to show you our approach that we've talked about in action and really bring it to life for you. So first on the list, we're going to go to Rotan, Honduras 
And I'm pleased to introduce you to Jenny Mighton, our Conservation Program Director, and Francis with the Rotan Marine Park, one of our local partners. And take it away from here. Hi, everybody. My name is Jenny Mighton, and I'm Coral's Conservation Program Director. I have the privilege to be here with Francis Land, the Executive Director of the Rotan Marine Park. We've been working and collaborating with the Rotan Marine Park since 2005. Coral gave them the first grant of $5,000, and now they have grown into a staff of 22. They have very important programs that they, that they continually do, patrols, education, research, and community development. Uh, but I'd like to pass it on to Francis, so maybe you can talk a little bit about the patrol program. Sure. Hi, Jenny. Thank you so much for the in nice introduction. Um, the Rotan Marine Park currently has different programs. One of our main programs is our patrol program, which we currently have five boats, two on the north side, two on the south side, and one, of the, one on the east side. Uh, our purpose is to deter illegal fishing, uh, identify constructions that is illegal or that is damaging the reef or damaging the, 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 uh, sorry, the, the environment itself. Uh, this includes when they are removing seagrass, when they are uh, removing mangroves, or any development that is actually illegal. But mostly we focus on the fish, which has helped us increase the fish biomass here in the Bay Islands. So the patrols are very key, not only because they identify all these illegal activities, but also because we also provide community services, like if we need to have any rescues, any support to the Navy, any support to the, any emergency, we are actually the ones who actually support this activity. And um, this was thanks to Coral. Coral initially uh, donated or yeah, funded our patrol programs and our marine infrastructure program in 2005. And right now, and during the pandemic, it was key, the funds that we received from Coral, because we were able to run the patrol program during the whole pandemic time. Uh, this was our main objective because actually the increase in incidents because of the low tourism and we were able to actually maintain our patrol programs during that time. So we were very thankful uh, at that moment, but not just that, uh, from the past, since the past, Coral has supported us with um, funds for things that we actually need. It's, uh, it's an organization that has, that has been able to understand the needs of the RMP and know where to what to fund to be able that the way that it could grow and that maybe people would other grants wouldn't support it because okay it's like salaries that many of the organizations don't do that they just want to support the activities but coral no they support this kind this kind of um, this uh, activities and um, this very important for the Rotan Marine Park to be able to be effective and grow also on the marketing side or sustainable financing we have shops coral has actually supported a lot of on our shops and on our marketing marketing campaigns so we can grow like a social media right now is something new for us it was something new for us right now thanks to Coral we are able to have a very strong marketing department and program here at the Rotary Marine Park so thank you so much Coral for all the support you're giving us oh no, and thank you Francis for letting us be part of this so the way that we work at Coral is that we really try and you know support the local organizations and we are working now currently with eight different local organizations and the idea is that we look at it holistically not just the programs that they're actually doing but how the organization itself needs to grow how it can be solid by as francis was mentioning you know marketing um business plans uh, strategic planning and of course funding and uh, this is a, a really important way of working i think it's different than how other organizations or international organizations work because we do really support the local organizations in fact i hope that our job is done and we can leave because <laughs> then we have organizations like the rotan marine park that are actually doing the job Anyway, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Francis and Jenny. You are definitely what hope looks like to me. And uh, we'll hear more from you in a little bit. But now we are going to take you all all the way to the other side of the globe um, and uh, visit our Maui with our Maui program. And remember, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. So you don't forget them and we'll address them very soon. Thanks. Aloha everybody, I'm Michaela Richmond. I'm the Hawaiian Islands Program Coordinator here in Hawaii. Um, I'm located on the island of Maui. 
Uh, right now we are in the Wahikui watershed of West Maui. Uh, you may know this area for popular tourist destinations such as the historic Lahaina town, Kaunapali Beach, or the famous Honolulu surf break. Um, you may be wondering, what is the Coral Reef Alliance doing working up here on the mountain? Well, in Hawaii, we actually have two main stressors to our coral reefs. One of those being sedimentation, which we're working on here in Waikuli, um, and the other being wastewater, which our program over on the Big Island is working to address. Here in Waikuli, we've focused on decommissioning old agricultural roads. And the reason is, is because we have all of these agricultural fields like these over here to my left that you're seeing that are just now full of invasive species. They're no longer being farmed, but they're not just sitting here. Um, they're actually degrading. And so what I mean by that is they are eroding. So the, the sediment on in these agricultural lands are actually bleeding out into our stream gulches and onto our coral reefs. And so we are working on kind of triaging this situation um, so that this this dirt stays on our landscape. And so the way that we're doing that is by decommissioning old agricultural roads that actually run parallel to our stream gulches because we know that that's the main location that sediment transport to our reefs is happening. And so what we do is we come in um, with these nature-based solutions. We believe that nature-based solutions are the longest term solutions that will actually address these problems on a large scale and be intact for a very long time. And so this degraded agricultural land needs to be reforested. We need to reestablish our dryland forest so that it can hold all that sediment in place. So the way we do that is in three phases. The first phase is actually installing things like um, these log rows. Uh, we also have grass rows, which I'll show you down here. And we install these rows perpendicular to the actual agricultural dirt road that's running parallel to the gulch. So I can trap this sediment. Here's one of our grass rows. Right behind it, we have one of our coconut coirs, which is basically this natural sock of coconut fiber that'll break down over time. But in the meantime, it's trapping all of the dirt. And so once that dirt is then trapped there, and the way that it gets there is through these big storm water events that actually run down the road like another stream that moves through here and so these stormwater events um, move a lot of the dirt over our BMPs which are now slowing that water down so I can settle out those fine grain sediments which are the most detrimental to our reefs and so after that we come in with phase two and that is installing the native plants um, that are meant to be here like that willy willy right there that's one of our native dryland species that's actually endemic to Hawaii. Um, we also have this koa tree that's establishing really well at our site. Um, and the intention with these phase two plantings in between the actual rows that we put in perpendicular to the road is to actually lock in that sediment so that it cannot be transported to our reefs in the future. And so by restoring this degraded agricultural land to an intact native dryland forest ecosystem, we can actually filter out all those sediments and address the problem at a larger scale. In order to scale up this work, we have to complete phase three, which includes maintenance, which is ongoing, um, and then of course monitoring. So we have things like these sediment posts that we install in order to track how much dirt we're actually keeping on land here. Um, and today at our um, current demonstration project site, we've trapped over 32 tons of sediment. And so by using this information to um, actually be able to translate the data to other areas, uh, we can actually scale up this restoration work statewide and then even beyond into other regions of the Pacific that are facing similar problems. And so we have plans moving forward to actually move into our stream gulch to tackle some of those sediments that are deposited down there as well. So we have a toolkit of responses to this issue. Um, we are working to move towards um, other areas such as Molokai, which is another island here in Maui Nui, and also um, working with partners to establish resilient coastal communities in areas like Oluwalu. So um, we hope you like our projects. We couldn't have done it without everyone's support for the Coral Reef Alliance. And back to you, Heather.
Thanks, Michaela. Um, it's so great to see our work out there. Um, so looking ahead, we're really excited to take everything that we've learned from the past 30 plus years and really scale it to grow um, to the need that the coral reefs have. And we're so thankful that you are part of the Coral Reef Alliance. Our success really depends on people like you. And our community is really our lifeblood of our work. And we hope you would consider supporting this work again this year. Uh, we look forward to con your, your continued partnership. Um, before we start tackling some questions and answers that you have, I'd like to introduce the chair of our board, Kirby Ryan, who's gonna say a few words. Thanks, Kirby. Thanks, Heather. And I just wanted to add a very quick uh, hello and a very big thank you to everyone tuning in for not only tuning in and your interest and participation, but for your ongoing support and involvement in our alliance. As you, as you can see, we've got some very exciting work around the globe led by an incredibly hardworking team um, that's, that's in position. And despite the challenges of the pandemic, despite the challenges uh, just uh, globally and from a governance perspective around the world, our team has, uh, has found a way to, to make it work and continues to plan to find a way and, and make our work uh, impactful around the globe. So I just wanted to add my huge thank you and a big kudos to the Coral team um, and excited to, uh, to take everyone's questions at, at this point. So thanks again and, and back to you, Heather. Thanks so much, Kirby. Uh, so we're, we're gonna go ahead and launch into some questions and answers. Thank you for those of you that are putting some there. Uh, please feel free to continue to do so as we move through these. Um, the first question uh, we have is, how do your initiatives work across geographies with very different political, social, and geographic landscapes? And do we experience resistance to our strategies and initiatives? So I'll start, and then Jenny, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it over to you. Uh, Jenny's our uh, you saw her in the video, the director of our conservation program. So what we try to do is share lessons learned, and we have many of them, things that have gone well, things that have not gone well, so that we don't have to recreate this exactly. Um, the same way in every geography, there will be differences. And we really, as, as you heard in the, um, uh, the conversation with the Honduras team, um, you, you have to really think about the needs of the local communities, the needs of the local nonprofits that we partner with, as well as that sort of governance uh, framework around them to help them be successful. So we do, it is particular to each place, but we try to share the lessons learned. So Jenny, what would you add to that? Jenny or Francis? Hi, everybody. Can you hear us? Just testing because, perfect. Well, thank you so much for that question. I, I'm actually really thrilled about that question. It's very interesting because everywhere that we've been working around the world, we actually have the same problems, very similar. Uh, we have sedimentation problems, we have sewage problems, we have uh, local governance issue problems. And the truth is that the way that we have been working to solve this is always place-based, look at the local threats, identify who are the local players and support the local players so that they, they can then address these threats for the longer term. Because as I was mentioning in the video before, you know, we are here to help, we are here to support, but we are here to support the local community so that they can be in charge and be stewards of their natural resources. Uh, you know, as an example, we were mentioning the Rod Marine Park. I'm, I'm really happy to have Francis right here next to me because this is a process that started in 2005, you know, with the first small grant. And we have been supporting this organization's growth and growth um, until where it is now. And, and what I do want to say is that, you know, once with the Rotten Marine Park, we've been working with patrols, but we realized once it was in a state that it was in a, in a very good place, so can still, of <laughs> course, can always get more support from our patrols. We're also now expanding to other, other threats like sewage and sanitation and building the capacity of those local organizations. And we're doing exactly the same in Hawaii, we've done exactly the same in Fiji where we used to work and in Indonesia. So it really is supporting the local initiatives. And I think that's our our, um, our uh, straight line through all of the programs that we do. 
and I don't know, Francis, is, if you would like to add anything more. <laughs> no, yes, I think the support from the uh, from Coral has been key to the development of the Rota Marine Park. Actually, right now, uh, we are able to cover at least 100% of the island. Uh, maybe not 24-7 as we wish, uh, and some areas required to improve, like we need on the east end an additional boat and more support. However, uh, I think right now, from my standpoint, I think Coral has given us the tools to be able to continue fundraising and get the whole community to believe in what the Marine Park does, uh, especially during patrols, which is something really uh, conflicting in some ways, because having patrols doing the enforcement is not easy, working with the government um, is uh, a very, uh, it's a challenge, right? But it's, with all the support that we have received, I think that the patrol has actually increased. People have seen the visibility, I mean, people have seen all the increase in the fish biomass that we have had here in Roatan, thanks to the support that we have had from Coral and all the patrols that we do. We actually patrol over 55,000 kilometers a year. So with the innovative technology that we have with SMART, then we can actually now calculate and tell people, hey, yeah, we this is how much we've been patrolling. This is how, this is the area that we cover. So, Jenny just, and Francis, um, while, while you're still on, can I have you just take, a, you know, maybe a minute or two? Because uh, we have another question specifically for you. And it was, how are the reefs in Rotan doing? And how do you track the health of coral reefs? Okay. <laughs> I can start that and then I, I will let uh, Francis do that. So we we have a really good alliance with the Healthy Reefs Initiative. It's an organization that brings together over 70 different organizations and all of us, all of the local organizations, we, we used a data collecting system called the Atlantic Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment. And with this, it's a standardized monitoring system so that we can go every two years and understand what is happening to our reef because in the end, we know, Coral knows, RMP knows, all of the organizations that work together know that we're doing a good job if we can see the results on the reef, if we can see the results in water quality on the reef. And so that, that is how we do the monitoring. We had actually been seeing improvement in fish biomass, both in commercial and herbivorous fish biomass. But unfortunately, stony coral tissue disease came into our area um, and really, I think we lost about 50% of our colonies and Francis has been leading uh, um, along with another organization called the Bannon Conservation Association, which we also support leading the work to try and do. What are the next steps? Yes, and I think uh, water quality, one of the key things that uh, corals are, Coral is doing with our community uh, to be able to be resilient. Uh, it has been very devastated for us to go into the water has been very hard, but also very, in a way, very hopeful because we see colonies that are still there, that are still strong or still going, and that really motivates us to keep on going. Um, and we're going to work with those colonies trying to do our coral restoration programs, which is be, it's going to be sexual and asexual reproduction. So it gives us the strength to actually keep on going and know that other organizations are collaborating like on the water quality. So it's not just RMP working, it's uh, uh, many organizations that are actually working towards the protection of the reef. So, and if I can Thank just you. add a little bit more of that, oh, okay. I just sure. say it's like an ecosystem of organizations, right? <laughs> just like we have an ecosystem on the reef, it's an ecosystem of organizations and each one of them is helping each other and trying to reduce the threats so that we can allow these baby corals to come back. Thank you both. And I love talking to Jenny and Francis about their misbehaving reefs <laughs> that we call them. There are some reefs that are just doing really well where they shouldn't. And uh, so we're really trying to figure out what how that is. And uh, we, we love those misbehaving reefs. Um, so I am now going to kick one of our questions over to um, Jen Vandiver who is our senior program manager in our Hawaii and in, in our Maui Nui program. And um, Jen, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Um, I, know you, I know the work you have to do, so I appreciate you taking the time here. Um, the question is, you, know, you must experience an influx of tourists in Maui. How does this impact the reefs where you work? Yeah, tourism can impact our reefs in a number of ways. Um, everything from just 
fins and standing on the reef and doing actual physical damage to the reef. Uh, we also have a partner, Project Reef, who makes reef safe sunscreen. And so we try to promote those types of ideas and, and provide guides for our tourists. Uh, other impacts are things like when we have so many more tourists on island, we actually have more wastewater that goes out onto the reef. So there's a number of different ways that tourists can impact our reefs, but we've worked to create signage and pamphlets and, and have education for those and working with tour, um, the hotels and that to educate the tourists. Thanks, Jen. I'll let you know if we have another question for you. I really appreciate it everything that our coral staff does every day um, and, and all of you as part of our alliance. I think we're going to go, go to uh, Helen, Dr. Helen Fox, for this next question. Helen, um, do you have initiatives in the Western Pacific, Micronesia, or the Marianas? So you want to address how we work there? Sure. So um, we don't currently have on the ground initiatives there, but there's sort of two ways I'd answer that question. First, we are actually uh, in early stages of working in the Indo-West Pacific, so more Indonesia and the Philippines rather than Micronesia and the Marianas. And also uh, we work with several other organizations such as IUCN that does have uh, a much broader scope. So what we are working to do is get some of the principles uh, behind what we're doing in terms of thinking about adaptation and long-term planning uh, for uh, incorporation into marine spatial planning efforts in those places. Thanks, Helen. Um, I've got another great question that I will start with, but if anyone um, on wants to add, uh, feel free. So the great, our favorite question, how can I help? <laughs> so we, again, we really appreciate everything that you all do um, for us. You know, there's opportunities um, in some of our field locations like Maui, where you can do volunteer work. So always let us know if you're in the area or you're visiting there. Um, you can actually just get hands-on and, and uh, help with the work there. Um, another thing that everyone can do is stay connected um, by in our communication streams, newsletter, social media. It's a great way to just kind of keep up to date on some of the things that are happening or that need support. Um, so that's another great way. Um, everyone uh, either dives or snorkels or travels to a beach or goes to, well, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people on this call do. And so a, another great thing that you can do to help is um, reef friendly travel. And so we can share a resource about that we have with that, um, but things like using um, reef uh, friendly sunscreen to the where you choose to stay, how you travel, uh, we have lots of great tips there that are thinking about coral reefs as you are uh, traveling and staying in those areas. And then, of course, we can't do any of this critical work to save coral reefs without uh, donations. And many of you are our are, are biggest supporters. And so that's always really, really important. And I know that there are lots of competing things and, um, that are happening in the world today. But coral reefs, are, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, are so critically important to the communities that surround them, but really all of us. They, they support, you know, 25% of marine eco or, uh, organisms. You know, there's just so much um, that we need our reefs for. So thank you very much. Um, so let me see what other questions. Um, Helen, it looks like we have another one that might be helpful to you. Um, to answer, how are you able to make coral reefs more adaptable to climate change? How do we how do we do that? So that's a great question. And there's, again, a couple of different answers. One is actually with our work just trying to reduce local threats. So the work that the Hawaii and Western Caribbean talked about, improving water quality, reducing other threats actually makes the corals themselves healthier, better able to reproduce, better able to resist bleaching and things like that. So that's very important is the local on the ground threat reduction work. Um, and what we're also trying to do is keep corals healthy for long-term evolutionary processes and protecting networks of corals. Because if you, know, you have corals that are surviving 
high heat events and then are able to reproduce and get their larvae out and travel to other areas, they're basically spreading their heat adapted larvae. And so overall, then the system becomes um, more adaptable to climate change. And it's a process called evolutionary rescue. And that's what we're trying to foster uh, with our work. Thanks, Helen. And while we still have you, I'm going to kick one more quick question to you. So we talked about all of those global commitments. Um, you know, can you just talk for a second about how we interact and how we are planning to be part of uh, the, like the UN treaty and, and things like that? Sure. So the, the high seas treaty, not so very much, just because most of the corals are you know, coastal uh, and the high seas are areas in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So I would say it was only very general there, uh, but we are definitely involved in a number of different ways. For example, the um, 30 by 30, the commitment that was made in Montreal uh, by countries to protect 30% of their land and seas by 2030, uh, we're involved in uh, helping produce guidance documents. What we're hoping to do is if there are then active marine spatial planning projects, we are hoping to you know, help the people who are involved with that. And uh, there's also one recent uh, update, the IUCN, the it's a, union of conservation organizations. I was just recently invited to be on their advisory uh, board as well uh, for their Marine Commission. So that's a, a great opportunity to both work with them and, and hopefully have some influence on what they're doing. What, absolutely. And I, I think it's important to highlight for folks that when we are able to get on um, committees like that or uh, like we have uh, one of our experts sitting on the statewide um, cesspool working group I mentioned earlier. There, it's just a, it, it's a way for us to influence what makes it into plans, plans that will be funded. Um, and so even though we've got our work, we have our work at these different scales, but that influence piece is, is really important because it, it tends to influence greater um, geographies. So I am going to kick uh, one more question over to you, uh, Jenny and Francis, um, in particular, probably Jenny on this one. Um, but uh, someone asked, how do we choose new field sites? So we talked a little bit about adding Belize as a field site. Um, just wondering, just if you could talk a little bit about some of that criteria, and I'm happy to add my two cents as well, but I thought I'd start with you. Oh, I think Hello, we're so the question was, how do we decide where to add new field sites? Yes. Like Belize that we mentioned. Okay. Well, there's something that's got to happen that's very important before, before anything else. One, we have to understand and know that there's an important reef that we need to protect. Two, we need to ensure that the communities there, the government, the local communities, all of the local stakeholders want us there. We're not coming to impose, we're only coming to support. So we have to have those two very important things. And then once we are invited and once we do have a new site, we have to understand that it's not just one place-based site, but we have to think about it as a network. We used to call them adaptive reef networks where we're gonna, we ensure that we're gonna have enough genetic diversity and different types of reef in an area that we're gonna be working that is actually going to then support and sustain evolutionary um, adaptation for reefs. I don't know if that answers the, the question or if I can go into it a little bit further. Francis, <laughs> would you like to answer anything more about that? Jenny, I think that's good for that question, but I will just um, quickly ask since Francis is there and I know this is something that um, is a great partnership. Uh, um, we have a question around, do we do coral restoration? So do you wanna take just a minute or two to answer that? Yes, uh, do we do coral restoration? I think, yes, I think it's a complement. Everything that we do is complements other ones, other uh, organizations actions or other groups actions. And I think coral restoration is very important. We're trying to upscale the coral restoration, trying to get science in, well, having science involved to 
so we can learn what's the best way to do it. But we can't keep our arms crossed. I think we need to be motivated and actually move forward. There's a lot of good things that are happening currently in many organizations in many countries that can't be used here in Honduras. And I think it's something that I know it's a lot of effort. It's a very labor intensive mm -hmm. and requires a lot of funding. However, in the long run, it's going in the long run is going to be uh, something that will contribute to the health of the reef. Exactly. And if I can add on to that, Francis, as, as I was mentioning before, we are an ecosystem, right? So if we have uh, different organizations that are trying to work on water quality and if we have patrols that are allowing us to have a good ecosystem of fish, then when you do have these restoration systems, you know, they can survive. And I also want to mention that it's something something that's also very important is that sometimes these restoration systems are a really good strategy to educate not only locals, but mm -hmm. also tourists. And that will also help them understand why they need to support these local organizations. Because once once you see a coral, once you hand it and once you plant it, you have a commitment to that coral. You have a commitment to that reef. And so sometimes that is also so much more valuable than just per se that that coral that you are putting back into the reef or that you are growing. Thanks so much, Jenny and Francis. Um, I know we ha still have a few questions, but we want to respect your time. So um, I just want to let you know that we actually, um, for all the attendees, we are going to be sending you a copy of the recording from today. So in case you miss something we went by quickly, um, you'll, you'll be able to catch it again on there. Um, we're also going to send a list of additional resources related to the topics we covered, and we will answer a few questions if we didn't get to them. Um, so just wanted to let you know that um, all of that will be coming your way very soon. And again, thank you so much for being here today. We value your time and your partnership, and uh, we can't do any of this work without you. So Thanks so much, uh, and we'll talk to you all soon. Have a great rest of your day.